Well, I mean, we've, we've uh, launched into a new sermon series in the book of James. And um, the book of James is, is a very practical book. Um, there's, it's like the, uh, the Proverbs of the New Testament. A lot of wisdom to be gleaned from it. And this morning I'm going to continue off where I left off in the series where I started off the book of James. And um, James, starting into chapter 1, he opens with an unexpected theme to rejoice when trials of diverse kinds um, come your way. And um, right after his greeting, he tells his readers that they are going to endure challenges as Christians, and he goes very, very far to say that these challenges are actually good because they will result in greater maturity for the believers. So, in the first half of the chapter, James speaks to us about the nature of trials of diverse kinds that we have to go through in this life. And these trials include being tempted to do wrong or to avoid doing what is right. So today we're going to be continuing in James chapter 1, and, and um, my text this morning is James chapter 1, verses 18 to 27, with a message that I've entitled, Listening and Doing. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I pray, God, that as I speak this morning, Lord, that your purposes would be accomplished, that you would help me to express the word in a way that would be honoring to you, in the way that you intended the people here to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So please turn with me in your Bibles if you have them or if you want to follow along with the overhead. We're going to be moving through quite a few supporting scriptures this morning, so it might not be a bad idea if you have the text in hand with your device or with your, your Bible. Um, so James makes it clear that God brought his salvation to us for a purpose. In James chapter 1, verse 18, we're told this. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Interesting verse. When you consider what this actually means, and I, I pondered on this, and I, the more I looked at it, the more I was excited about it. When you consider what this actually means, there's a wonderful truth that's discovered. Now, the Bible clearly teaches us, and we know from the, from the book of John, um, from the very first chapter of John, we're told that um, Jesus Christ, who had come down to us in the flesh, is actually the living Word of God. He is God in the flesh, and He's called the living Word of God who came to us from the Father. And Jesus made a way for us to be made spiritually alive. Now, the whole human race, because of disobedience and sin, was spiritually dead to God. But, but through His sacrifice for us on the cross, Jesus paid the full price of the penalty of our sins. When we truly come to believe in Jesus, the Bible teaches us that we are washed clean on the inside and that our spirits are brought to life as the Holy Spirit enters us. And, and this is what it is meant to be a born-again Christian. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, Jesus was speaking to his disciples and, and he told them this. He said, yet a time is coming and it has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So in verse 18 of our text this morning, we see that James teaches that out of all of creation, God chose to give us spiritual life through Jesus that we might be a kind of first fruit 
of all that he has created. First fruit, you might ask. Maybe you've never heard an explanation of this before. The principle of first fruits was well established through the Old Testament times. And for ancient civilizations, um, the start of the harvest time was a very significant time because that was when all the hard work that the farmers had put into their land began to pay off. All the crops began to produce fruit, and finally they began to see the results of their labor. The people were literally reaping what they had sown. In the Bible, the word first fruits, for your information, it's mentioned 32 times in Scripture. This is a very valuable concept for believers to understand. The very mention of the word is found, the very first mention of the word is found in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, where God's people are instructed, it says, to celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. So the people were, were commanded by God to celebrate the festival of the harvest with the first fruits of everything that came in. They were also instructed to bring the best of the first fruits into the house of the Lord. In Exodus 23, 19, we're told, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. And this begins the idea of giving God our first fruits and our very best. In the law of Moses, God made it clear to the Israelites that the first tenth of the harvest that would be collected belonged to him and was to be dedicated to him as an offering. In Leviticus chapter 23.10, the Lord instructs Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land, I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest. Bring the priest a sheaf of the first grain that you harvest. Furthermore, Moses instructed the people in Deuteronomy chapter 14, 22 to 24. He says this to them. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God, the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. So, the Israelites were called by Moses to consider the first fruits of their crops and the firstborn of all their livestock as being specially dedicated to the Lord. When the tithe was delivered to the tabernacle and later the temple, a portion of that tithe was actually commanded to be partaken of and enjoyed as a ceremonial meal before the Lord. And the remainder was given to the priests so that the temple of God could run and the priests and their families could be fed. Interestingly, the, the rest of that harvest of, that, of that, that time would not be taken in until the first fruits had been brought in and consecrated to the Lord. This was done in recognition that it was God who had blessed the land that the people were working. It was God who had blessed them with their children. It was God who blessed them with the means and the strength to make a living and to feed their families. The principle of tithing and first fruits was established in honor and respect to the provisions provided by the goodness of the Lord. So when you, when you go back into what we just heard in the opening verse of my text this morning, from James, when you, when you think of James telling his hearers that they had been brought to life in the Spirit of God, and they were like a kind of first fruits of all that God created, there is a very profound point being made here. See, James tells us that God has established born-again Christians as a kind of first fruit. Out of all the creation from the beginning of time, we, as born-again Christians who have been given the Spirit of God, who have been forgiven of our sins, 
have been cleansed from our sins and have been given the Holy Spirit, we are like first fruits out of all of creation. We have been set apart as an offering to the glory of God because the Lord Himself has done the work. The Lord has planted His seed in the hearts of men. And the seed has grown and it is, and it is bearing fruit. And we are the first fruits. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. We're told in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11, that there is a throne room in heaven. And there are 24 elders in that throne room. And one of the things that those elders are doing in the presence of Almighty God before His throne is they're proclaiming out loud to Him. They're proclaiming, You are worthy, our, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So as the first fruits of all that God created, we have been chosen by God to be displayed as a harvest of righteousness in honor of the Lord and His provision of goodness. Isn't that incredible? Sometimes we get it wrong, people. We get it wrong. Sometimes we think of God as existing for our benefit. But actually, the opposite is true. God does not exist for our benefit. We exist for God's benefit. God does not exist to serve our interests. We were created to serve His. And it's only when we get this that we can live in harmony in our spirit because we were made to be at one with our Creator. We were made to, to have that relationship with our God and through Jesus that was made possible because you were brought to life in the Spirit because of the Word of life that came to you. Not only in the words from Jesus' mouth, but in His very being as the living Word of God. The Apostle Paul, like, like James, he speaks of the principle of, of first fruits when he calls out to born again Christians in Romans chapter 12, the first verse and the second verse, part of the, the first part of the second verse. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body, bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, because we've been set apart for God's benefit, we were made, we were actually created to worship Him. When we do, we discover the true meaning of our life, and we have harmony and peace and joy in our existence. And that comes even in the midst of the deepest, darkest valleys. What an encouragement. God calls us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Why? Because we're the first fruits. We're the first fruits. We are to be set apart for Him. You see the beauty of this? Set apart for Him. Like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, 14-16, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who has called you is holy in all that you do, be holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. I'm going to read that again. As obedient children... Do not confirm to the evil, conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. 
So we see this. In the same manner that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter speaks of Christians being a living sacrifice to the Lord, James lays a foundation of righteous qualities that God desires us to possess as the first fruits of His harvest. So he continues teaching in verses 19 to 21. He says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. <laughs> wow. As God's holy people, we know this, right? We are saved by grace. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This isn't of yourselves. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is the core um, understanding of the born-again Christian. That it's not us earning our way to be accepted by God, but it is by God's grace that we've been saved through faith. And this isn't of ourselves, but we are called to actively display our true Christian convictions by doing good out of love and out of reverence for Him in recognition of who He is. So in short, a Spirit-led believer is an offering of first fruits to God. We are called to earnestly embrace the path of God's wisdom for His glory. Not for ours, but for His. So James introduces one of the major issues that humanity has problems dealing with that, that brings about wrongdoing. So he moves into that to try and, and talk to us about some of the things. As a servant of God, we are called to take the attitude of Jesus on. Right? We're called to be like Christ in our attitude. And Christ, who being in very nature with God, came to serve other people. He came to serve, to seek and to save that which was lost. He, he humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross. Why? Because of his great love for us. To make a way for us so that we could be brought back into harmony with him. So we could be brought back into oneness with him. And, and he did this sacrificially. He, he, he's a creator. He spoke things into existence. He... He was God before time began. And He'll be God everlasting to everlasting. And the everlasting God who spoke things into existence gave Himself to be a sacrifice so that you could be at one with Him. This is great love. Greater love there's no man than this and He laid down His life for His friends. God's considered us to be His friends. The first fruits of his labor. He loves us. He loves you. You know, so James tells the people that essentially they need to adopt the attitude of Christ. To take on an attitude of serving others. What does he say? He says that the followers of Jesus should be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry. When we lose our tempers easily, isn't it true that we become self-focused? And when we become self-focused, we fall into sin. I don't know how many times that I've let my temper get the best of me. And, you know, there's been times where I've been easily angered. And I look back on those times and I see the fallout of those decisions. And I'm like, oh God, have mercy. <laughs> you know, 
It's so true. You know, becoming easily angered doesn't bring about the righteousness that God desires in His first fruits. So, so James is saying, he makes it clear that a quick-tempered person does not produce the kind of righteousness which God expects from His children. And, and people who lose their temper easily, they give people the wrong impression about the true nature of Christianity. And maybe I've been in that club. Maybe you have too. But it doesn't have to be that way. How do we keep ourselves from getting angry quickly? Well, there's some disciplines that we need to practice and to embrace. So I know that God has made me alive in Christ Jesus. He's given me His Spirit by grace. But by grace, He has also given me a new heart. A heart that now beats for Him. So, if His Spirit is within me, and I know that I am alive in Him, when I come to temptation, and I'm tempted to blow my fuse, what do I need to do? Uh, first of all, I need to repent of my tendency to be self-focused, Lord. You know how easily I am about all about me and how I feel and how um, those people that are offending me right now, I just want to kick back. I want to hit back. I want justice to be served. I want to be in control of this. That's the root of this, right? And in that moment of weakness, it's in human nature this is the cause of the fall, right? They wanted to be like God. They wanted the controls. So at the moment of my weakness, I depend upon God to help me rather than strike out in defense of my position to help me to love and to forgive other people of the brokenness that they're wearing on their sleeve towards me. Just as God forgave my sin and God loved me despite, despite the fact that I was wretched. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13, we're told this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I think I said this the last message I preached that, you know, we have a sinful nature, and sometimes we mess it up. Sometimes we sin, don't we? But we don't have to sin. We're not bound as slaves to sin. God did not abandon us in the midst of our trial of temptation. No matter what it is, He doesn't abandon us. The Bible here, we just read it, says that there's no temptation that we face that is unique to us as individuals. We often face what others have faced and are currently facing. And, and temptations are a test of the strength of our character. And it, as His children, is it not our desire to live a life of honor and dignity? That's what makes overcoming temptation an important issue. We long to be Christ-like. We long to be, to be like Him. But we live in this world, don't we? This broken world filled with wickedness where the strength of morals has taken a deep decline and, 
And as the day approaches where the Lord is coming, we see wickedness increasing upon the earth. You and I rub shoulders with it on all fronts every day of our existence here in this body. In overcoming temptation to sin, God calls me to resist the tempter. If I'm tempted to be quick to get angry, I am instructed to close my mouth. In the flesh, it's not easy to close our mouths, is it? But God is not giving us an instruction on something that is not possible for us to carry out because it's not just you that are standing up against your temptation, but you have one who walks with you. He lives in you. His power is within you. Why? Because know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The reason Jesus died was to bring you back to oneness with God so that He can live within you, so that He can give you the power to become the children of God, to be the first fruits of all that He has created. So when I close my mouth and I become an active listener, I'm participating with God. I'm, I'm doing this prayerfully. God, you know that I don't have the strength to keep my mouth shut right now. Because <laughs> this person has just got under the last craw here. And uh, this is the last string. No, it's not the last string. God's giving you provisions to stand up and to do what's right and to overcome you don't have to yield to your sinful nature. So, I steer my mind away from self-gratification, embracing other-centered behavior. Being easily angered? What, what is that a sign of? It's a, it's a sign of self-focus. I'm, I'm missing the big picture, and I'm just focused on the injuries that are being done to me. So when I close my mouth and I become an active listener, I embrace other-centered behavior. So I listen. Likewise, when I choose to restrain myself in blurting out the first thing that comes to mind, I'm slow to speak, even when my emotions within me are boiling and going, yeah, you need to get this off your chest. That guy deserves to get an earful. Right? Arr, that's the sin nature. It just wants to wants to gain control of that other person. It's, it's a matter of us actually being tempted to take the position of God. It is mine to avenge, says the Lord. This is what he says, right? So if your enemy's hungry, you feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him a drink. Why? Because that's not our business. Our business is to love our enemies, to pray for those who despitefully use us and do all manner of evil against us, accusing us falsely, all these things. Our responsibility is to humbly let God take that. Say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. And you know that if I open my mouth right now, probably something not good is going to result. Have you been part of the carnage where you, you've, you've sinned in that? You know, you've opened your mouth and you said things that you wish you could take back. Goodness, if you're a parent, you see this all the time, don't you? <laughs> we have those temptations, right, to, to do this. Okay, well, at this moment, God, I yield myself to the overcoming power of the Holy Spirit and I exercise, I choose to exercise the self-control that you have provided for me. See, it's not, I can do this on my own and I, got all, I can work it up within myself. No. Lord, you are the one that can give me the strength to do this. So I turn my attention to you. And I choose to love you, God, despite how I feel, despite how I want to uh, 
to gain control over the circumstance. Again, when I do that, I choose to embrace other-centered behavior. See, the Holy Spirit works with our will. And we're called to yield our will to the Holy Spirit. It's the same process when I face temptation to let my mind go towards moral filth. When I choose to restrain myself by turning my attention away from the temptation and inwardly humble myself before the Lord, recognizing my need for help, that strength will rise within me and give me the power to be an overcomer. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. When you're tempted, be firstly conscious of God's provision to help you through any tempting circumstances. There is always a what to do connect with what God has provided. It doesn't just leave us there hanging without a solution. There is always a what to do with what God has provided. Never assume that you are not well enough equipped to overturn a tempting situation. You must be conscious that in every tempting situation, you have what it takes to stand and overcome because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. He has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. This is the promise of the living God who has called you to be a first fruit of all that He's created, to be honoring to Him, to be holy as He is holy. Discover the way out of every temptation that comes towards you. There is a way. You know, temptations, they don't come from God, but they're permitted by Him, right? We've talked about this already. Because it develops perseverance within us and strengthens our character. God knows that temptations are going to come and roost on your doorstep. Jesus was tempted like us, but without sin. He knows that if you trust Him and you walk with Him and you walk in the Spirit perfectly, right, you're not going to fall. If you fall, it's going to be your fault. This is where we need to take responsibility. Right? If we fall, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. Because He's given us the provisions to be strong. And if we walk in ignorance of that, the devil will shortchange us. He's always looking for a way to cause us to stumble and to remove our effectiveness and productivity of our knowledge of Christ. To ruin our witness out there for, with people that need to hear the gospel, that need to know the truth that would set them free. So, not only do we be per conscious of God's provision to help us through a tempting situation, but we need to take heed to God's word. And this is going to help us build our strength before temptation comes to us. If, if a person is steeping their li lives in the Word of God, if you're steeping and you're meditating on the Word of God, well, King David had it right. You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. Your leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever you do shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they're like the chaff that the wind drives away. See the promise? It's beautiful. Take heed to God's Word. We're told in Proverbs 24.10, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? Well, if your strength is small, like most human beings is, we need, we need to be strengthened. You see, build up strength by meditating and, and heeding God's Word. John, John 17, 15 to 21, Jesus was praying. He was praying for his disciples. 
I want you to listen to this prayer. Because this, this prayer is not just for the disciples that were walking with Jesus at, at that day. This prayer is for us, the people here in this generation who are sitting gathered together in this church. It's for us. Listen to the prayer that Jesus says. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, he's praying to the Father, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into this world, I have sent them into this world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. This is where we come in. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me that's the promise of God. I believe that Jesus prayed this prayer as he was praying it in his all powerful omniscience. He saw you sitting in the pew that you're sitting in right here today. God, we put him in a box sometimes. But God is omnipotent, he knows all things, he was before all things. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. Jesus prayed this for you. And when Jesus prays to the Father on your behalf, you better believe that something is going to happen. God has not abandoned you like an orphan. No. He's given you overcoming power. Pray for the strength. Your, praise are, your prayers are a way to ask God for strength. We need His grace, don't we? We need His grace coming into salvation, but we need His grace moment by moment in every day. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. Not greater are we within ourselves than He that is in the world. Greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. Our God is greater than our enemy. Our God is greater than all sin. He is able to establish us and to keep us safe. So, what do we do when we're tempted? We can be tempted from within and tempted from without, right? Right? What do you do when the temptation comes from within yourself? I think we talked about that. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Call out on Him for His strength. What about when others invite us to join with them in ungodly behavior? Whether that be a temptation to embrace a malicious spirit and gossip about another person instead of praying for them whether it be to embrace human anger and play God by turning our attention towards people as being our adversaries rather than the true enemy of our souls, which is the devil. Or if our temptation is to join with another person and to fall into perversity and to participate with them in any kind of moral filth. Remember what the text that I read says? Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. It's not easy, is it? <laughs> Jude 17 to 21 says, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, 
who merely follow natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. So then, when facing temptation, we need to turn our attention towards God because greater is He that is in us. Lord, this is tempting. My sin nature is going, yeah, I should do this. Lord, give me the strength to forego self-gratification, self-focus, and to be intention, intentional when it comes to addressing the desires that pave the way to sinful actions. Lord, help me to be other-centered and to think about others before I act because I know that in myself I will fall. But you can make me a servant so that I can serve the interests of others and I can love others just as you have loved me. So, we need to turn our eyes away from the temptation and fix our eyes on Jesus. Sometimes I think we fall into temptation and we fall into sin through that temptation because we don't take our eyes away from the temptation. We need to turn our eyes away from the temptation. Romans 13, 14, Paul says, Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. We need, when faced with temptation, we need to stand our ground and put on the full armor of God. That's what we read in Ephesians, right? Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand, having done everything to stand. Therefore, put on what? All the armor that's listed. Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. Listen to this, people. And it is sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are His and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. This is a partnership that God calls us to. Not because we're trying to earn our salvation, but because we love God and we want to be close to Him and we love other people and we want them to come to know God like He's come, He's, he's made us alive to know Him. We want others to experience the same thing, right? So to do this, we need to walk as Jesus walked. And this is not an impossibility. I know you might be thinking, well, I, you don't know the level of temptation that I face. There is no temptation which is uncommon to men. All of us face the same sort of things. 1 Peter 5.8 instructs the believer saying, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil longs to devour us with falling into temptations and sinning in various ways because he knows that it's going to keep us from being the church as the light out there in effectiveness. We don't have to do this cycle in sin. We don't have to. God's given us the provision. He's given us His spirits. I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect in that. I'm not. You're not either. But our hearts need to be turned towards God. This is a partnership. We need to flee from sin. If something comes to us and it's tempting us, it's time to pick up and get out of there. If you're into a scenario where you're tempted, get out now. Don't sit there and ponder if you're tempted to go and get drunk, don't stare at the glass of wine before you and ponder how good that must taste and how good that makes you, would make you feel. The more you sit there and you stare at it, the worse the temptation is going to get and it's going to give birth to sin and then it's going to, it's going to ruin your closeness with God. The prodigal son was still a son, but he wasn't very close to his father, was he? God longed for him to come home with arms open wide. He longed for that day. And this is why James says, and this is, I'm going to be finishing with this. He says this. And this is 
you know, some people have had problems over this. Oh, this is all legalistic. No, no, no. Don't get this wrong, okay? James is not about legalism. James is about walking in a way that demonstrates the inward change. It's an outward reflection of an inward change. And if there's no outward reflection of the inward change, we need to ask ourselves, what's going on in here? And we need to call out on the Lord and ask Him to forgive us. And we need to repent. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that our God and our, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself by being polluted by the world. See that? There's a partnership here. Some Christians say, okay, I'm saved by grace, so now I just coast. Yeah, I can't help myself. It's my sin nature, so I'm going to sin, so I might as well just sin. No! No, no. That's not what James is saying here. He's not saying that you're going to earn your salvation. What he's saying is that God wants you to, to walk with him and to let his power transform you by the renewing of your mind. So, if we have found ourselves falling into the devil's trap of being hearers of the word and not doers of it, he wants us to repent. When a repentant person changes his mind about sin, that change will naturally lead to turning away from sin. Why? Because when you repent, you're saying in your heart, God, I'm tired of doing it my way. I don't want to do it my way any longer. I want you to have the controls in my heart. Lord, I know that I can't trust myself. I know that my sin nature is strong. But I also know, Lord, that you have overcome and that you have promised to give me overcoming power so that I can walk in this world in a way that is pleasing to you. Because, Lord, I am a first fruit of all that you created, consecrated and set aside, set apart, born again. And as that, Lord, I make my life a living sacrifice to you. Would you accept my life, Lord, as a living sacrifice to you? I turn away from worthless things, Lord. I turn, Lord, I turn away from those things and I ask God for you to help me. Help me. Fill me with your spirit so that I can walk in a way that demonstrates the life-changing power that is resident in you. God, I recognize that the result of my mind change concerning sin is going to be the fruit of righteousness. We don't want to be leafy branches, people that have the appearance of life but no fruit. We're the first fruits. God wants us to bear fruit, bear the fruit of righteousness. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have given us provision. Lord, we also thank you, God, that you have told us that if we claim to be without sin, that we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Lord, we all stand here today or sit here today in recognition that we need you. In ourselves, Lord, we cannot overcome. But you also said if we confess our sins that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. God, today, 
There's people here that are struggling. We live in a world where we rub shoulders with all kinds of evil, and there's people that are struggling, really struggling with attitudes, actions, with motives. God, we just, as your people, God, we just say, Lord, we don't want to forsake our first love, but Lord, we want our love to be renewed. Because we know, Lord, that it's only you that can help us to stand strong and to be an example of faith, love, and purity that you desire us to be. So, Lord, we commit our lives to you. We turn away from worthless things. We turn our eyes to you and we say, Lord, help us. Help us. Have mercy on us, Lord. Help us to walk in such a way that is pleasing to you. God, would you make this church strong? The church is your people. God, would everyone here realize that they are the first fruits of all that you have created and May our hearts be filled with gratefulness and may we offer our lives as living sacrifices to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.